Uhuru, uh, brothers and sisters and comrades, uh, welcome uh, to the study. This week, as it has been mentioned, we're going to continue looking at dial uh, materialism and the dialectical method, a book uh, by Maurice Cornforth that was first published in the United States in 1953. And uh, we have a lot of disagreements with Cornforth, as you will see as we move forward. The one thing being that uh, Cornforth, uh, in discussing dialectical and historical or dialectical materialism, uh, uh, characterized it as Marxism, uh, or the Marxist way. Uh, uh, but the, the fact is that uh, dialectical materialism is simply a, a method of investigating and analyzing. Uh, uh, and it's called uh, historical materialism when we apply the method of, uh, of, uh, of uh, analyzing and investigating uh, society is characterized as historical materialism. And uh, it is through this scientific process, and one of the reasons we appreciate it so much is the scientific process that was uh, really uh, developed uh, by Marx, uh, uh, his friend uh, Engels, and beyond that by other uh, revolutionary forces who consider themselves Marxists or communists, uh, but one of the things that uh, makes it so important, it is a scientific method of looking at things, of apprehending things, of making analysis. Uh, and we use this process uh, because it's scientific. And we come to uh, several really, really important um, uh, differences uh, with uh, Marx. And I think that uh, we have sometimes lazy people who characterize uh, uh, this as, as Marxism uh, because they do not use the method of investigation and analyzing uh, to come to conclusions of their own. Generally speaking, uh, what we consider Marxism is more than just a method of investigation and analyzing, but it's also the conclusions that Marx came to. And we disagree with a lot of the conclusions that Marx came to. I mean, fundamental conclusion uh, and, uh, but we came to different conclusions using the scientific method. I don't know, uh, so I just want to say that. And uh, so we'll see this over and over again, how Cornforth references uh, the method of investigation and analyzing uh, society or phenomena in the world. He characterizes this as Marxism, uh, but we are not Marxists, we're African internationalists, and we came to uh, certain conclusions using uh, this scientific method. Uh, that uh, Marx did uh, play a, a really important role in developing. Which is not to say that uh, the dialectical uh, and materialist method of investigation and analysis did not exist prior to Marx. Uh, it probably wasn't called that. I mean, you couldn't build pyramids uh, 4,000 years ago uh, without uh, using a scientific process to do that. You had to have the ability uh, to a uh, scientific process of investigating and analyzing society to to do some of the things that we know uh, that happened a long, long, long time ago. But I, want to, uh, I wanted to make that statement, and I think that uh, well, one of the reasons we want to have this discussion uh, is because, uh, in many ways, uh, the landscape, the political uh, landscape today is barren, philosophically barren, uh, that people do stuff, and uh, they, what they do seems not, never to be tethered uh, to some position, some philosophical position. They never have to justify what they do based on what the outcome uh, of it is supposed to do beyond uh, the action itself. And, and sometimes, uh, in politically, uh, we call that opportunism uh, in a sense that uh, uh, people uh, can get really caught up in the action and the movement is everything but the revolution is nothing. And we're saying that it's not enough just to be involved in movement. Uh, and this, uh, of course, uh, right now I'm speaking to you from uh, St. Louis Ferguson, and, and Ferguson is the, is the, uh, the headquarters of uh, a protest movement uh, in the country at this moment. Protesters are everywhere, professional protesters. Uh, but one of the things that uh, is significant about that is there is no to what end. So people protest. Uh, but there is no to what end. So uh, we say that it's really important uh, to really look at uh, who you are philosophically, uh, where is it that anybody is trying to go uh, in the real world. Uh, and the thing is that, uh, as we talked uh, last week, 
uh, we made the point that uh, the African working class uh, need its, needs its own philosophy. Uh, because everybody has a philosophy, and all philosophy is class philosophy. And the dominant forces in society are those forces which are responsible uh, for creating uh, and, and uh, systematizing philosophy. Uh, they are representative of a particular class, and that's the ruling class, generally speaking. And most of the people are uh, trapped with the ruling class uh, approach to every question, how the ruling class sees things. So even though uh, we may be looking at the world, generally speaking, what we're doing is looking at the world through the lenses of the ruling class. And if the working class that's oppressed by the ruling class and the system of the ruling class doesn't have its own philosophical outlook, doesn't have its own worldview, then we uh, stand the chance and most likely what we do is borrow our ideas and our philosophy from the ruling class. And that doesn't serve us in terms of making us free. Last week, uh, we made uh, several points. And I just want to say that <clears throat> that was in part one. We're looking at materialism. That's what we're doing today. The, 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 the study uh, itself is on dialectical materialism. Uh, last week, uh, we looked at part one was on materialism. And it began with a discussion of party philosophy. And uh, I'm going to read just the uh, brief uh, introduction to that, and then we go uh, to uh, the second part of this discussion on materialism. Uh, and so uh, the part one, uh, just the intro to it, uh, it reads, every philosophy expresses a class outlook, but in contrast to the exploiting classes, which have always sought to uphold and justify their class position by various disguises and falsifications, the working class, from its very class position and, uh, and aims, is, connect, is concerned to know and understand things just as they are without disguise uh, or falsification. <laughs> the party of the working class needs a philosophy which expresses a revolutionary class outlook. Uh, the alternative is to embrace ideas hostile to the working class and to socialism. Uh, this determines the materialist character of our philosophy. So this is how we opened up uh, this discussion on last week. And of course, we went much uh, further than that in the discussion. And what we're going to do now is go to part two. And uh, the title of part two is Materialism and Idealism. It's important to recognize that because when we talk about materialism, uh, part of how we define imperialism is in opposition to idealism. Materialism and idealism are two uh, opposing philosophical uh, 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 methods, so uh, outlooks. So uh, this is on page 15. Uh, of this uh, text, and we, and we uh, start off by saying, uh, and first of all, I also want to say that usually we haven't used Cornforth's uh, book as the text that we will work from because we do have the differences that I just mentioned earlier on with Cornforth. Uh, but the thing that uh, we appreciate about Cornforth, one is how this discussion is structured. It takes us uh, from uh, you know, point A you know, all the way through, and it gives us an opportunity for people who are not familiar with philosophy, but it, it gives us a, a foundation that we can work for, and it gets you know, a little more complicated as we move uh, forward. Uh, so and, uh, we like the way this thing is structured, and that's why we use uh, 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 Cornforth. Um, and uh, Cornforth himself, uh, was a member of the British Communist Party. And uh, uh, he uh, apparently played like an important role in their uh, agitprop or the agitation propaganda uh, uh, department area. Uh, it appears that this was part of what Cornforth's responsibility was, is to um, uh, help people understand uh, the philosophy of the, of the, uh, uh, of the Communist Party. And uh, philosophy is something that's usually, uh, you, know, you know, eggheads and people in these lofty places uh, who talk above the heads of people. You don't, and sometimes they come up with extraordinary uh, kinds of, 
discussions that ordinary people don't necessarily grasp. You can go to something that's supposed to be philosophy and, and you know, put you to sleep. You're just bored. Why the hell are you even involved in this kind of discussion? Uh, and uh, so it's been out of the reach of the working class. And it's mostly this, this, this stuff that, uh, again, uh, professors and, and uh, bourgeois intellectuals engage in. And sometimes it's uh, absurd, the kind of stuff, stuff that they, uh, you know, grapple with or discuss. And it seems like as though often uh, they have discussions and that the uh, discussions uh, revolve simply around the discussion itself and, you know, how, how uh, uh, contrived an idea can be and how um, involved. And, and the French were extraordinarily good at this. And sometimes uh, Marx, uh, Marx himself uh, seems to have been really influenced uh, by, uh, by uh, French philosophers. And, uh, uh, and you know, the French philosophers, they even develop a kind of language of their own, even though they speak in the same language as, as most of the people who they were addressing, but they have this way of putting stuff that's extraordinarily complicated and difficult to understand. So ordinary working class people never had access to these uh, philosophical debates. Well, what uh, we've come to understand is extraordinarily important because most people uh, simply see the world uh, and don't recognize that we are seeing the world uh, based on how we've been taught to see the world. Uh, and the way we've been taught to see the world uh, is a consequence of our relationship uh, to the social system itself. The dominant so the dominant forces in society are those forces which develop and put forth the ideas that, uh, that uh, informs the people of that society. And as we said early on, the party, uh, not only of the working class, as in this uh, kind of abstract way that he puts it, but certainly the colony, the party of the colonized African working class, the colonized African working class party uh, needs a philosophy uh, of its own. The colonized working class needs a philosophy of its own because it is a philosophy that has to contend with the philosophy of the oppressor. And if you colonize, uh, does not have uh, its own philosopher, if we don't, philosophy, if we don't have our own philosophy, what we do ultimately is borrow the philosophical uh, outlook, the worldview of those who oppress us. That's just the way that works because they are the ones who have systematized uh, uh, philosophy and worldviews and things like that. It's not like you find that colonized working class uh, sitting around in libraries writing, you know, uh, you know, these huge uh, tomes and stuff like that. That's bourgeoisie and the leisure class and forces like that that end up doing these kinds of things. So I'm going to go ahead now to page 15, materialism and idealism. These this is important to remember. When we talk about materialism, we could write materialism versus idealism. Uh, materialism and idealism are defined uh, uh, essentially as opposed uh, to each other in terms of uh, uh, a worldview, a philosophical worldview and outlook. So uh, materialism is opposed to idealism sense, while idealism holds that the spiritual or ideal is prior to the material, materialism holds that matter is prior. This difference manifests itself in opposed ways of interpreting and understanding every question, and so in opposed attitudes in practice. While idealism takes many subtle forms in the writings of philosophers, it is at bottom a continuation of a belief in the supernatural. It involves beliefs in two worlds, in the ideal or supernatural world over against the real material world. In essence, idealism is a conservative reactionary force, and its reactionary influence is demonstrated in practice. Marxism uh, uh, adopts a consistent standpoint of militant materialism. We can say African internationalism. Uh, does this. Materialism and idealism oppose ways of interpreting every question. Our philosophy is called dialectic materialism, said Stalin. Stalin wrote a pamphlet on dialectic materialism because it approached, its approach to the phenomena of nature, its method of, 
of studying and apprehending them is dialectical, while its interpretation of the phenomena of nature, its con conception of these phenomena, its theory is materialist. So uh, its method of studying and apprehending them, that is to say phenomena in nature, is dialectical while its interpretation, its method of studying and, and, uh, and apprehending uh, phenomena in nature is dialectical while its interpretation of the phenomena of nature, its con conception of these phenomena, its theory is materialistic, okay? Uh, and I know, you know, this might begin, you know, um, a little problematic, but as we move forward in this discussion, we'll see what we mean when we say it's dialectical. This method of studying and apprehending them is dialectical uh, while uh, 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 if the conception, the theory is materialistic. So we've already said that uh, uh, a materialism and idealism are opposing ways of uh, interpreting every question. Materialism is not a dogmatic system. It is rather a way of interpreting, conceiving of, explaining every question. The materialist way of interpreting events, of conceiving of things and their interconnections is opposed to the idealist way of interpreting and conceiving of them. Materialism is opposed to idealism. With every question, there is a materialist and idealist. Uh, there are materialist and idealist ways of interpreting it, materialist and idealist ways of trying to understand it with every question. Thus, materialism and idealism are not two opposed abstract theories about the nature of the world of small concern to ordinary practical folk. They are opposed ways of interpreting and understanding every question and consequently they express opposite approaches in practice and lead to very different conclusions in terms of practical activity. Nor are they as some use the terms opposite moral attitudes. One the high-minded, the other base and self-seeking. You know, because Madonna is a materialist girl, right? And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I mean, uh, so the whole thing is that the way that the bourgeoisie talks about being a materialist means that you're just out for, for wealth, you know, uh, just trying to hustle and get all the stuff, you know. Uh, and then idealism, they put it as high-minded and, you know, and that kind of thing. If we use uh, the terms like this, we will never understand the opposition between capitalist and materialist conception. For this way of speaking is, as Engels said, nothing but an unpardonable concession to the tradition of Philistine prejudice against the word materialism resulting from the long continued defamation by the priests. By the word materialism, the Philistine understands gluttony, drunkenness, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, arrogance, cupidity, miserliness, profit hunting, and stock exchange swindling. In short, all the filthy vices in which he himself indulges in privately. <laughs> By the word idealism, he understands the belief in virtue, universal philanthropy, and in, general, uh, and in a general way, uh, a better world of which he boasts before others. Before trying to define materialism and idealism in general terms, let us consider how these two ways of understanding things are expressed in relation to certain simple and familiar questions. This will help us to grasp the significance of the distinction between a materialist and an idealist interpretation. First. Let us consider a very familiar uh, natural phenomenon, a thunderstorm. What causes thunderstorms? An idealist way of answering this question is to say that thunderstorms are due to the anger of God. Being angry, he arranges for lightning and thunderbolts to descend upon mankind. The materialist way of understanding thunderstorms is opposed to this. The materialists uh, will try to explain and understand thunderstorms as being solely due to what we call natural forces. For example, ancient materialists suggested that far 
from thunderstorms being due to the anger of the gods, they were caused by material particles in the clouds banging against one another. That this particular explanation was wrong is not the point. The point is that as that it was an attempt as uh, at materialists as opposed to ideal ex, uh, ex, explanation. Now a great deal more is known about thunderstorms arising from the scientific investigation of the natural forces involved. Knowledge remains very incomplete, but at all events enough is known to make it quite clear that the explanation must be on materialist lines so that the idealist explanation has become thoroughly discredited. It will be seen that while the idealist explanation tries to relate the phenomena to be explained to some spiritual cause, in this case the anger of God, the materialist explanation relates it to material causes. In this uh, example, most educated people today would agree uh, in accepting the materialist interpretation. Uh, this is because they generally accept the scientific explanation of natural phenomena, and every advance of natural science is an advance in the materialist understanding of nature. Let us make a, take a second example, this time one arising out of social life. For, for instance, why are there rich and poor? This is a question which many people ask, especially poor people. <laughs> the most straightforward idealist answer to this question is to say simply, uh, it is because God made them so. It is the will of God that some should be rich and others poor. You've heard this before. It's even biblical. You know, the rich, the poor will always be with us, right? Uh, but other less straightforward idealist explanations are more in vogue. For example, it is because some men are careful and farsighted, and these husband their resources and grow rich, while others are thriftless and stupid, and these remain poor. Those who favor this type of explanation say that it is all due to eternal human nature. You've heard that before, too. It's the, you hear this concept of human nature. It's human nature. I mean, it's just a man's nature to be like this. You know, it's the human nature, etc. The nature of man and society is such that the distinction of rich and poor necessarily arises. Just as in the case of the thunderstorm. So in the case of the rich and poor, the idealist seeks for some spiritual cause. If not in the will of God, the divine mind then in certain innate characteristics of the human mind. And for Africans, of course, uh, we grow up with an explanation, too, of why white people are rich, are much better off, and Africans are poor. And the explanation used to be quite blatant, uh, quite open, uh, because white people are civilized, more civilized than we, uh, thriftier than we, uh, this kind of stuff. And this is... The general explanation, this plays out today. It's not said exactly like that, but it plays itself out today. Uh, you ain't got nothing because you wear your, 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 your pants sagging, uh, because you don't know how to do job interviews, uh, because uh, just a whole bunch of stuff that has no real relationship to the fundamental basis of why African people would be poor and white people rich. It obscures the reality that we are poor because white people stole everything from us and they are rich <laughs> for the same reason, right? So you don't get to that. And so we get an idealist uh, explanation for this reality as opposed to a materialist explanation for this reality. And so uh, we, uh, using the, the whole uh, method of investigation uh, and analysis uh, provided us by uh, 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 dialectical materialism, uh, we become African internationalists. We uh, examine the world using, uh, from a materialist uh, standpoint, and of course using the dialectical method as well that we'll talk about a little further on in this discussion. The materialist, on the other hand, seeks to reason in material economic conditions of social life. Now, God did this to you, uh, and you will hear this all the time. You read it in the editorial, news, in the newspapers. They don't necessarily say God, uh, but they make it other kinds of, uh, of, uh, 
uh, obscure and, and sometimes not obscure uh, uh, basis uh, for why we are poor uh, and don't have anything uh, that is offered by corn for. Uh, if society is divided uh, into rich and poor, it is because the production of the material means of life is so ordered that some have possession of the land and other means of production while the rest have to work for them. And that speaks in so many in volumes to our condition, but Cornforth doesn't mean this when he says it, but Africans, all our land was taken. And whether you're in Africa or whether you in the United States or someplace else, you know what I mean? All our land was taken. This is the basis for the impoverishment or the poverty of African people all around the world. Um, and uh, the means of production taken from us. That's what the whole, when we, that's what we say that uh, that uh, uh, politics uh, is nothing but concentrated economics, right, is because uh, the, the whole means of producing, uh, the productive forces uh, have been taken out of the hands of African people. We don't even have possession of productive forces, uh, even as those uh, forces include uh, human beings with the laborers uh, with the knowledge of how to do the work. We don't even have possession of that. That Somebody else has possession of that. Uh, uh, and that's what colonialism is all about. So uh, however hard they may work and however much they may scrape and save, the non-possessors will remain poor while the possessors grow rich on the fruits of their labor. This is the materialist uh, way of seeing things. On such questions, therefore, the difference between a materialist and an idealist conception can be very important. And the difference is important, not merely in a theoretical, but in a practical sense. A materialist conception of thunderstorms, for example, helps us to take precautions against them, such as fitting buildings with lightning conductors. But if our explanation of thunderstorms is idealist, all we can do is watch and pray, right? And, and uh, you know, Africans are confronted with this uh, materialist versus uh, idealist uh, view uh, every day. Uh, you know, they would say that the reason for our oppression is racism because white people don't like you. Yeah. So if that's the reason of your oppression, your poverty, everything that's happened to you, then how the hell do you change it? This is an idealist worldview that's been imposed on our community. It's one of the reasons we say up your racism. You understand? Because they want to make the ideas in the heads of white people the basis for the conditions that we experience and suffer from. Uh, uh, or they make us responsible ourselves. This began because we are shiftless and less civilized. We wear our pants sagging and uh, that kind of thing. And play the music too loud. <laughs> but if our explanation of thunderstorms, uh, yeah, so if we accept an idealist account of the existence of rich and poor, all we can do is to accept the existing state of affairs, uh, rejoicing in our superior status and um, uh, uh, bestowing a little charity if we are rich and cursing our fate if we are poor. But armed with the materialist understanding of society, we can begin to see the way to change society. It's only materialist way. You have to be armed with the materialist worldview in, in order to know that you can change it. You can begin to see the way to change it. You can come up sometimes with wrong ideas, uh, 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 but you see the way to change it if you are armed with a materialist uh, worldview. It is clear, therefore, that uh, while some may have a vested interest in idealism, it is in the interest of the great majority to learn to think and to understand things in the materialist way. How then can we define materialism and idealism and the differences between them in general terms so as to define the essence of the question? This was done by Engels. Uh, and this is quoting uh, Engels. Uh, the great basic question of all philosophy, especially of modern philosophy, is that concerning the relation of thinking and being. The answers to which the philosophers have given to this question split them into two great camps. Those who asserted the primacy of spirit to nature and therefore, in the last instance, assumed world creation in some form or another comprised the camp of idealism. 
The others who regarded nature as primary belong to the various schools of materialism. Unquote. Idealism is a way of interpreting things which regards the spiritual as prior to the material, whereas materialism regards the material as prior. Idealism supposes that everything material is dependent on and determined by something spiritual, uh, whereas materialist recognizes that everything spiritual is dependent on and determined by something material. Uh, and this difference manifests itself both in general philosophical conceptions of the world as a whole and in conceptions of particular things and events. I, at bottom, idealism is religion, theology. Idealism is clericalism, wrote Lenin. All idealism is a continuation of the religious approach to questions even though particular idealist theories have shed their religious skin. Idealism is inseparable from superstition, belief in the supernatural, the mysterious, and the unknowable. Materialism, on the other hand, seeks for explanations in terms belonging to the material world, in terms of factors which we can verify, understand, and control. The roots of the idealist conception of things are then the same as those of religion. To believers, the conception of re conceptions of religion, that is to say conceptions of supernatural spiritual beings, generally seem to have that justification, not of course in any evidence of the senses, but in something which lies deep within the spiritual nature of man. And indeed, it is true that these conceptions do have very deep roots in the historical development of human consciousness. But what is their origin? How did such conceptions arise in the first place? We can certainly not regard such conceptions as being the products of religion, it's as, uh, of being, uh, as being the products as religion uh, itself tells us of divine revelations or as arising from any other supernatural for cause if we find that they themselves had a natural origin, and such an origin can indeed, uh, can in fact be traced. Let's go back. Uh, so we say, uh, 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 but what is their origin? How, do, how did such conceptions arise in the first place? We can certainly not regard such conceptions as being the products of, reli as religion tells us, of divine revelations, or as arising from any other supernatural co cause if we can find that they themselves have a, have a natural origin, and such an origin can, in fact, be traced. Right? Conceptions of the supernatural and religious ideas in general owe their origin, first of all, to the helplessness and ignorance of men in, in face of the f uh, forces of nature. Forces which men cannot understand are personified. They are represented as manifestations of the activity of spirits. For example, such alarming events as thunderstorms were, as we have seen, explained fantastically as due to, as due to the anger of gods. Again, such important phenomena as the growth of crops were put down to the activity of a spirit. It was believed that the corn spirit, uh, it was the corn spirit that made the corn grow. For the, from the most primitive times, men personified natural forces in this way. With the birth of class society, which when men were impelled to act by social relations which dominated them and which they did not understand, they further invented supernatural agencies doubling, as it were, the state of society. The gods were invented superior to mankind just as the kings and lords were superior to the common people. All religion and all idealism has at its heart this kind of doubling of the world. It is dualistic and invents a dominating ideal or supernatural world over against the real material. Because what happens is that uh, while um, 
uh, people uh, often talk about the white man's religion, right? The white man's religion is responsible for this, so we need to have the black man's religion. <laughs> So white people's idealism uh, is worse than black people's idealism, you know, but you still got damn idealism. I don't care how you look at it, you know, uh, we need a black Christmas, uh, black Santa Claus as opposed to a white Santa Claus. We have the black Christmas. We have, what is that thing they call uh, uh, Kwanzaa, uh, you know, except we have to have our own uh, black, red, black, and green idealism is uh, <laughs> what we have to have, right? Uh, and, and so you still end up with idealism, right? And, uh, and which keeps you uh, from getting to the material world that is the basis of the contradiction that you have to deal with. But you want to change the world. You want to change stuff. That's the thing that sent many of the best people into the damn religion in the first place. People did that because they want a better world. They want to be better people and they want to find a better world. And so uh, they give you a fanciful explanation of reality. I, I saw some time ago, many years ago, I saw uh, a documentary on Cuba. It was an anti-Cuban, anti-communist documentary. But I, it was really interesting because they showed how before the success of the Cuban Revolution, the churches were filled. And you see all these poor people in church, all these black people in church in Cuba. And then after the revolution, people stopped going to church, right? Only people you found in church was the white people who had previously been wealthy in Cuba. Now the poor people got power in their hands. They don't have to base on praying and God and all this stuff. They needed houses. They built houses. They didn't go pray for the damn house. They went and talked to the neighbors and organized them. We built houses. We built streets. We did everything that was necessary. So this, this imaginary super force that the poor uh, and, and the uneducated uh, uh, you know, uh, had to rely on, you don't have to rely on that stuff anymore. Once you don't have to rely on that, then your everything clears up for you. And people who were previously thought to be dumb and stupid and stuff like that are out changing the world. And this is the thing that happens. That's why it's so important what we do right there among the working class itself. So they can begin to see its place in the world based on real stuff, not some fanciful notion that has been imposed on us from above. Now, let me see this by the senses. Very characteristic of idealism are such antithesis as soul and body, God and man, the heavenly kingdom, kingdom and the earthly kingdom, uh, the forms and ideas of things grasped by the intellect, and the world of material reality perceptible by, by the senses. So this has been put forth as antithesis, right? They're separate from each other, right? They uh, 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 oppose uh, more or less. So this doubling of the world is carried to its further limits in subjective idealism. It's another form, another expression of idealism. Subjective idealism, which ends, which ends, uh, and subjective, you know, when you talk about subjective as opposed to uh, objective, what is subjective is what's in your head, but what is objective is what's in the world, right? Uh, so uh, what is subjective is how your brain, how you perceive stuff, uh, but there are some things that are true, independent of how you perceive them, independent of your thought. Otherwise, blind person, you know, uh, wouldn't be able to get around like uh, DJ Eddie, you know, in 96.3 or Ray Charles. You, you, because you can't see anything, right? So, uh, but you learn uh, there's an objective reality, independent of your ability to see to understand. There are some things that are real. And if you don't learn some of these things that are real, then you will die. All kinds of horrible things will happen to you, right? So there is this contradiction all the time uh, between subjectivism, what is in our brain, and what's in the world. And to the extent that what's in our brain matches up with what's in the world, then we are sometimes considered sane. But if you are this place where what's in your head is out of touch with everything that's in the world, people put you in straitjacket and put you in little rubber rooms and stuff and call you crazy, right? Uh, but there must be this relationship between thinking and being, right? And that's, uh, uh, so anyway, so we have, they say, this doubling of the world is carried to its furthest limits in subjective idealism, uh, which ends by regarding the material world as a mere illusion and asserts that only the non-material world is real. Uh, this dualistic character of all idealism is most marked in subjective idealism, which posits a complete antithesis between the me mechanistic system 
uh, of the illusory material world and the freedom of the higher non-material reality. So, so there's this antithesis between uh, uh, this system, uh, the mechanistic system of the illusory material world and the freedom of the higher non-material uh, reality. And we'll move forward with this. This antithesis is disguised as, uh, as it often is behind allegedly scientific and empiricist theorizing characteristics uh, characterizing uh, all idealist philosophers, uh, philosophers from Berkeley uh, to John Dewey. We, we'll, we'll explain this a little more moving forward. Uh, for idealism, uh, there is always a higher, more real, non-material world. There's a higher, more real, non-material world, which is prior to the material world. It is its ultimate source, source and cause and to which the material world is subject. For materialism, on the other hand, there is one world, the material world. By idealism in philosophy, we mean any doctrine which says that beyond material reality, there is a higher spiritual reality in terms of which the material reality is in the last analysis to be explained. So let's look at some varieties, uh, what he called modern phil uh, philosophy. This is written in 1950-something, early 50s. Uh, uh, but what we'll see is that some of this is reflected in stuff today. Have you ever met anybody who says that um, uh, um, I'm free because I think I'm free? You've heard that before. Yeah, yeah I'm free because I think I'm free. You understand? And, and you hear this uh, kind of stuff. Uh, uh, you know, which is extraordinary. I mean, you know, I, you, know you, you have that discussion with somebody in prison. You know, uh, uh, African catching more hell than anybody. Uh, I was talking uh, with a comrade last night uh, when we came from dinner, and uh, we were just looking at how, with the election of Obama, uh, we saw that polls were done where the conditions of African people were worse than any time uh, in recent history and the polls uh, asked people in this country were they better off or worse off, and the Africans were the only ones saying we were better off now uh, than uh, before. And the conditions of African people were worse than they were before. And this is idealist BS, you know what I mean? That's why we were able to do that uh, because Obama was elected, and, it, and we had to think that things were better off because the Negro uh, was the president. And it's like O.J. Simpson is innocent. <laughs> uh, and we had to think that he was, he was innocent, uh, in part because we wanted him not to go to jail for killing them white people. Because it was time for somebody to kill some white people, you understand, and get away with it. So, so we can't say, we know he did it, but, uh, you know, uh, but let him go anyway. So we said, no, he didn't do it. Hell no, he didn't do it. That's a purely idealistic, you know, approach to things. Then white people were idealistic because they said, well, how can they say not guilty with all the evidence? And Africa said, well, when did evidence have a damn thing to do with convicting, <laughs> convicting somebody, right? And so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, uh, let me see, where was I? Uh, say it again? Oh, I'm sorry, okay. So for idealism, uh, we said there's a, there is a higher, more real, non-material world which is prior to the material world. It, it is uh, its ultimate source and cause, as to this non-material world, and to which the material world is subject. For materialism, on the other hand, there is one world, the material world. Uh, by uh, idealism and philosophy, we mean that any doctrine which says that beyond material reality, there is a higher spiritual reality in terms of which the material reality is in the last analysis to be explained. And then we looked at what they call some varieties of modern philosophy. And then uh, at this point, a few observations may be used, useful concerning some characteristic doctrines of modern bourgeois philosophy. For nearly 300 years, it has been put forward a 
variety of philosophy known as subjective idealism. This is one of the problems we have also with Cornforce, because he's talking about something that happened for nearly 300 years, that this has been happening in philosophy, but hell, white people, you know, just made it on the scene. Philosophy has been here for a very long period of time. That's why people go back and looking at Egyptian books of the dead and all this other kind of stuff, because philosophy has been around for a long time. But he's talking from the experience of Europe, and, and that's helpful for us, too, because uh, our introduction to many of these questions is due to our introduction to European uh, imperialism, et cetera. So we need to know this guy. We need to know how he thinks and what is the basis for, uh, for uh, how uh, he has come to certain kinds of conclusions about us. And it's helpful for us to know what we're working with. I like that. I like uh, uh, to know even people who I disagree with I like to know uh, the philosophical basis for what they're saying. Uh, because then, then at least you got something um, against which you can make your arguments. You understand? If you're dealing with them and struggling with them, uh, as opposed to somebody, I, 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 I distrust and, and, and don't like people who uh, uh, pretend not to uh, act like they don't have any, any belief system. How do you debate that? You know, because uh, they can be anything they want to be, anytime they want to be. It's just they're this today, that tomorrow, uh, et cetera. And there's a certain kind of uh, uh, dishonesty associated with that and, and non-integrity. I'd rather see somebody, or uh, you know, uh, religious people who believe in this stuff, and they say, this is the basis for my belief, et cetera, et cetera. At least you got something you can work with, and you can even hold them to. You can't hold somebody who don't believe in nothing. There's nothing that you can even hold them to. You can't debate them against uh, anything. So, so for nearly 300 years, uh, this is 300 years, um, there has been put forth a variety of philosophy known as subjective idealism. This teaches that the material world does not exist at all. Nothing exists but the sensations and ideas in our minds. And there is no external material reality corresponding to them. Now, that might sound crazy, but I've known people who made this kind of argument, right? You know, uh, you know, you say this is real, but it's not real. The only thing that's real is what I think is, you know, I think about this, this is what makes uh, stuff real. Um, and then again, this subjective idealism is put forward in the form of a doctrine concerning knowledge. It denies that we can know anything about objective reality outside ourselves and says that we can have knowledge of appearances only and not of things in themselves. Uh, this sort of idealism has become uh, very fashionable today. This was in the 50s when this was written and even parades as extremely scientific when capitalism was still a progressive force and this is the European view about the progressive character of capitalism Bourgeois thinkers used to believe that we could know more and more about the real world and so control natural forces and improve the lot of mankind indefinitely. Now they are saying that the real world is unknowable, the arena of mysterious forces which pass our uh, comprehension. It is not difficult to see that the fashion for such doctrines is just a symptom of the decay of capitalism. And certainly, uh, the capitalist colonialists get really stupid, right? It used to be that the world, you know, they'd open up the world, see the world, because they were uh, exploring and robbing and looting, and the, and the sky is the limit. Now, uh, they're opposed to uh, ideas and things like that, and, uh, and, and, you know, that challenge the existing, existing reality. And that makes it even difficult for the capitalist society itself to progress. Because it cannot progress unless it can explore the future, can see the future. And it can't see the future because standing in front of the future is the struggles of the peoples of the world. And they can't, they can't expose that. They can't explore that. They can't go beyond that. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, because that uh, shows them uh, 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 the, uh, that they, they, uh, their, their ability to be here... Uh, is uh, coming to an end. In fact, it's really interesting that you will discover that the crisis of imperialism like this, you hear more and more discussions about the end of time. Yeah. You, you hear this, the end of time. This is the end of time. And you're right, it's the end of your time, you understand? <laughs> and they can't see anything beyond that. And uh, uh, that's the crisis of imperialism. We have seen that at bottom, uh, idealism always believes in two worlds, the ideal and the material. And it places the idea prior to and above the material. 
Materialism, on the other hand, knows uh, one world only, the material world, and refuses to invent a second imaginary superior ideal world. Materialism and idealism are irreconcilably opposed, but this does not stop many philosophers from trying to reconcile and combine them. In philosophy, there are also various, various attempted compromises between idealism and materialism. One such attempted compromise is often known as dualism. Such a compromise philosophy asserts the existence of the spiritual as separate and distinct from the material, but it tries to place the two of them on a level. It, thus it treats the world of non-living matter, the world of non-living matter, the table, the rock, you know, uh, uh, et cetera, um, uh, in a thoroughly materialistic uh, way. Uh, this is, this, it says, is the sphere of activity of, of natural forces and spiritual uh, factors do not enter into it and have nothing to do with it in any way. So they'll concede the wall, the trees, the rocks, the pavement and stuff like that uh, is material reality. Uh, uh, but when it comes to mind and society, here says this philosophy is the sphere of activity of spirit. Here it maintains we must seek explanations of, uh, in idealist and not in materialist uh, terms. Such a compromise between materialism and idealism therefore amounts to this that with regard, with regard to all the most important questions concerning men, society, and history, we are to continue to adopt idealist conceptions and to oppose materialism. Africa cannot stand that. Africa cannot move forward, cannot survive off that. Juju will not help us a damn bit. We got to have science. We got to pave streets. We got to kill the mosquito. We got to cure malaria. We got to, you know, just do all kinds of things to grow our society uh, as, as Africans in the world. And they would have us, you know, uh, you know, with spooks and, and juju and other kinds of things like this. Uh, another compromise philosophy is known as realism. In its modern form, this philosophy has ris arisen in opposition to subjective idealism. Remember subjective idealism? Uh, so the realist philosophers say that the external material world really exists independent of our perceptions and is in some way reflected in, uh, by our perceptions. In this, the realists agree with the materialists in opposition to subjective idealism. Indeed, you cannot be a materialist unless you're a thoroughgoing realist on the question of the real existence of the material world. But merely to assert that the external world exists independent of, of our perceiving it is not to be a materialist. For example, the great Catholic philosopher of the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas, was uh, in this sense, a realist. And to this day, most Catholic theologians regard it as heresy to be anything but a realist in philosophy. But at the same time, they assert that the material world, which really exists, was created by God. Okay, they say, okay, there is a material world, but God created it, right? Uh, and it's sustained and ruled all the time by the power of God, by a spiritual power. So far from being materialist, they are idealists. For this, as for modern realism, it concedes to materialism the bare existence of matter. And uh, for the rest, is ready to concede everything to idealism. Moreover, the word realism in such is much abused by philosophers. So long as you believe that something or other is real, you may call yourself a realist. Some philosophers think not only is the world of material things real, but that there is also outside space and time a real world of universals, of the abstract essence of things. Uh, so these call themselves realists. Others say that although nothing exists but the perceptions in our mind, nevertheless, these perceptions are real, right? Uh, so these call themselves realists too. Uh, all of which goes to show that some philosophers are very tricky in their use of words. <laughs> Uh, the basic teachings of materialism in opposition to idealism. I want to quickly run through this. Uh, in opposition to all the forms of idealism and, and of tricky compromises between materialism and idealism, the basic teachings of materialism can be formulated very simply and clearly. To grasp the essence of these teachings, we must also understand that what are the main assertions made in every form of idealism. They, there are three such main assertions of idealism. One, 
Idealism asserts that the material world is dependent on the spiritual. Two, idealism asserts that spirit or mind or idea can and does exist in separation from matter. The most extreme form of this assertion is subjective idealism, which asserts that matter does not exist at all, but it's pure illusion. Uh, three, idealism asserts that there exists a realm of the mysterious and the unknowable above or beyond or behind what can be ascertained and known by perception, experience, and science. You remember the story of Frankenstein? Uh, was it Shelley? Was it uh, Shelley who wrote that? Would you, anybody remember? Mary yeah, Mary Shelley, yeah. And you remember uh, the great crime that Frankenstein created? Anybody remember? Well, it's the same crime that, uh, that uh, 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 Eve and Adam committed, messing with the tree of knowledge, right? And so uh, uh, Frankenstein, he goes so far as to think he can actually create life, right? And this is, you know, only God can create life. This guy's going against God actually trying to create life. And so this is the real offense. This is why the monster goes crazy, does all these kind of things. It shows that the limitations of science. You can only go so far messing with this science. Other stuff is the realm of God. This is the, you know, and this is the whole idealistic, you know, like perception of things. Uh, and so we say that the basic teachings of materialism stand in opposition to these uh, three assertions of idealism. One, materialism teaches that the world is by its very nature material, that everything which exists comes into being on the basis of material causes, arises and develops in accordance with the laws of motion of matter. You know what the laws of motion of matter, you know what the study of motion of matter is, is called, don't you? Say it again. Physics, yeah. <laughs> materialism teaches that matter is objective reality existing outside and independent of the mind, and that far from the mental existing in separation from the material, everything mere, mental or spiritual is a product of material processes. Uh, and when we say uh, the, the uh, material is superior uh, here in this instance, and because they're like, you've heard mind over matter, you know, mind over matter. Well, you've heard, you've seen perhaps the things that I, I, ex uh, I think, therefore I exist, right? Uh, uh, but the reality is that, uh, that the mind itself is a product of matter developed to its highest uh, extent. And what is that matter? The brain. The brain is matter, material. And you can end this debate with any idealist around this question by handling a gun, say, shoot yourself in the head, and then tell me what you think about it. <laughs> what, what do you think about that, right? <laughs> Materialism three. Materialism teaches that the world and its laws are fully knowable, and that while much may not be known, there is nothing which by nature is unknowable. Yes. Uh, and so he characterizes Marxist Lenin's philosophy is characterized by the absolutely consistent materialism all along the line, uh, by its making no concessions whatever to any point uh, to idealism. Thus Stalin points out, one, uh, quote, a, uh, contrary to idealism, which regards the world as uh, embodiment of an absolute idea, a uh, universal spirit, consciousness, uh, Marx philosoph philosophical materialism holds that the world is by its very nature material, and that the multifold phenomena of the world cons constitute different forms of matter in motion, and that the world uh, develops in accordance with the laws of movement of matter and stands in no need of a universal spirit. B, contrary to idealism, which asserts that only our mind uh, really exists, the Marxist materialist philosophy holds that matter, nature, being, uh, is an objective reality existing outside and independent of our mind. Uh, that matter is primary since it is the source of sensations, ideas, mind. Matter is primary since it is the source of sensations, ideas, mind, and that mind is secondary, secondary derivative since it is a reflection of matter, a reflection of being, that thought is a product of matter, which in its development has reached a high degree of perfection, namely the brain. Uh, and the brain is the organ of thought, and that therefore one cannot separate thought from matter without committing a grave error. Uh, C, uh, contrary to idealism, which denies the possibility of knowing the world and its laws, Marxist philosophy, philosophical materialism holds that the world and its laws are fully knowable, 
uh, that our knowledge uh, of the laws of nature tested by experiment and practice is authentic knowledge having the validity of objective truth and that there are no such things in the world which are unknowable but only things which are still not known uh, but which will be discovered and made known by the efforts of science and practice. You can't conceive that this stuff you just can't know. I mean, you can't conceive that. You have to have a worldview uh, that leaves open the possibility of solving all the damn problems in the world. You have to have that ability. If you start off by saying, well, there's some stuff we just ain't supposed to know, right? Uh, then you won't know that. And then uh, you will not uh, be able to deal with malaria and all the other afflictions that uh, confront uh, human beings in nature and in society. Uh, as was pointed out above, the opposition of materialism and idealism, which has now been stated in the most general terms, is not an opposition between abstract theories of the nature of the world. It is, uh, but is an opposition between different ways of understanding and interpreting every question. Uh, that is why it is of such profound uh, importance. Let us consider some of the very practical ways in which the opposition of materialism and idealism is manifested. Idealists tell us, for example, not to place too much reliance on science. They tell us that the most important truths are beyond the reach of science. Hence, they encourage us not to believe things on the basis of evidence, experience, practice, but to take them on trust from those who pretend to know best and have some higher source of information. And this is really interesting because uh, uh, the best, uh, uh, if you look, if we go back to like uh, biblical stuff, right, uh, the great sin that put everybody in trouble, that's been the cause of every affliction in human society is eating from the tree of knowledge. Not just from a damn tree, but the tree of knowledge, the tree of knowing something, the tree of being able to discover. And then you have this ongoing argument by people who will tell you that, uh, uh, that the basis of their belief in God is, is what they cannot understand. They say, uh, well, if there is no God, then how do you explain the moon? Or, you know, things going up instead of down or, you know, I mean, all these kinds of things. And so, in other words, uh, uh, if I don't know the answer to these questions, then there must be a God. And, you know, uh, and that places such severe limitations on just human uh, expectations and aspirations and what have you. And it does, it, it uh, denies us the ability uh, to even uh, look for uh, a greater uh, kind of truth. And in fact, uh, in, if you're a Christian, uh, the highest virtue uh, is faith. And not evidence. And you start looking for evidence and whatever. You're like Thomas. Let me see the holes in your hand and your feet. You remember the biblical Thomas? You know, this guy said, I just came back from, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, you know, if you was dead and then nail you on the cross, I want to see the holes in your hands and your feet too. Because I want to be, I want the evidence. I want the material evidence. But, but faith is more important than evidence in the Christian belief. You, if you have faith, faith without any evidence is the thing that gives you great virtue, etc. So ignorance is something that's uh, really raised uh, to the heights and what have you. And we are opposed to ignorance. In this way, idealism is a very good friend and standby of every form of reactionary propaganda. It is the philosophy of the capitalist press and radio. It favors superstitions of all sorts, prevents us from thinking for ourselves and taking a scientific approach to moral and social problems. Listen, go to any supermarket, go through the checkout lines, see what you see in the checkout lines. Um, uh, Elvis discovered on the moon. You know, these pamphlets and stuff like this, stuff that feeds garbage to the working class. You will not find a comic strip in the New York Times. You will not find a comic strip in the Wall Street Journal. You will not find horoscopes in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, anything that's for the upper class. It's only the working class that they want to keep mired in this kind of stuff. And, and when you go, like I said, go through the supermarket. Uh, Two-headed goat found on the moon. I mean, this kind of stuff is what they feed uh, 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 the working class all the time, keep us mired. Uh, and this kind of stuff, why the bourgeoisie, you have to leave town to get a damn Wall Street Journal or New York Times. I mean, you can't find this kind of stuff in the African community. And uh, this is just a basic reality that we are confronted with because they want to keep us mired in superstition, find out what your really number is, your lucky number is, and stuff like that. This kind of stuff, while the bourgeoisie uh, is reading, uh, uh, and I was having a discussion last night 
uh, we were talking about how shallow uh, some newspapers that we had looked at, New York Times and stuff like this, shallow and shallow every day. And while the Wall Street Journal, at least you can find something, and you can find it in the Wall Street Journal. You know why? Because it's written for the bourgeoisie, and the bourgeoisie has to know what the hell the world, how the, the world is working. And they can put this stuff out in plain daylight. Who among us reads the Wall Street Journal? Who among us reads foreign affairs? They got it in the, got in the damn bookstores, but we go there, we will not look for foreign affairs or anything like that. They heat the stuff right in plain sight. This is the bourgeoisie speaking to itself. No cartoons. No, no comic strips, no horoscopes, none of this stuff that keeps people mired in superstitions uh, uh, and the rest of and idealism just, and these are the debates the bourgeoisie is having about the life of everybody on the damn planet. You know, they're having these discussions among themselves. They don't even have to worry about it. They can hide it in plain sight uh, uh, because ordinary people are not going to look at it. It's written for them. Yes. And uh, so I go and peek in it and see what the hell are y'all thinking about, you understand? Uh, so again, idealists tell us that the most important for, all, for us all is the inner life of the soul. Uh, they tell us that we shall never solve our human problems except by some inner regeneration. A regeneration. This is a favorable uh, thing uh, in the speeches of well-fed persons. But many workers fall for it too. In factories, for example, uh, there was so-called moral rearmament group uh, uh, was active. This is during the, the second imperialist war that he's talking about. Uh, they tell you not to fight for better conditions, but to improve your soul. Not, they do not tell you that the best way to improve yourself, both materially and morally, is to join in the fight for peace and socialism. Again, an idealist approach is common amongst many socialists, many Sincere socialists, for example, think that there is essentially wrong, uh, what is essentially wrong with capitalism is that goods are unfairly distributed and that if we could only get everyone, including the capitalists, to accept the new conception of fairness and justice, then we could do away with the evils of capitalism. Uh, you hear this even today. There are people coming and say, well, you know, can we just... Uh, talk to the capitalists or make them do this. Or can we just, all the rich black people, can we just get them to give us the money and stuff like this is the way forward? They, they, don't, uh, they don't explain the nature of the social system itself. Yes. And the social system it has no sense of morality. Yes. It's not based on morality. It's based on the interests of social forces that dominate the damn world. And so the capitalists don't exploit us because they have bad thoughts. In fact, they convince themselves that they're the best people in the world. Yeah, yeah, they are convinced that they are morally higher up than, than anybody else on the planet Earth and that your poverty is a basis on your immorality. You, you have too many babies, you have do all of this, and that, of course, you're not rich enough to have your own damn island to have 14-year-old girls and, and, and stuff like that shipped to you like uh, Epstein uh, was just able to do. So the idealism of this belief is in an assumption that it is simply the ideas which we hold that de define the way we live and, and society is organized. And what is that except uh, the definition of the struggle against racism? That somehow it's the ideas that's responsible for our condition. White people don't like us, uh, therefore that's the basis of our conditions. Uh, so, and, and we're talking now about he, what he was talking about uh, uh, you know, s some, you know, pretty decent people. These are not bad people who came to these ideas. They, in fact, Lumumba at one time, Patrice Lumumba, who they ended up having to uh, murder butcher, uh, was somebody who at one time told uh, all of the people in Congo just make a friend with one of the Belgian oppressors. Everybody, in order to get out of this, we just go and make a friend with the Belgian oppressor. So, I mean, that's, it's not bad people necessarily, but we're talking about your worldview. How you perceive the world, the method you use of investigating and analyzing the world, that's the thing that would define where you're going, whether you're going any place at all. So, uh, so uh, we say that uh, the idealism in this belief lies in the assumption that it's simply the ideas uh, which we hold that determines the way we live and the way society is organized. Those who think in this way forget to look for the material causes. For what, in fact, determines the way goods are distributed in capitalist society? The wealth enjoyed by one part of society while the other and greater part live in poverty is not the ideas which men hold about the distribution of wealth, but the material fact that the mode of production rests on the exploitation of the worker by capitalists. But the beyond that, and, and, and the basis of that, is colonial domination of African and other oppressed peoples around the world. 
This is a materialist explanation. And even the Marxists don't come up with a material explanation because they can't explain that the reason the majority of people on earth are starving. I mean, they come up with stuff talking about the 1%. You hear this stuff about, this, we, you know, it's just the 1%. We are the 99%. When in the hell have white people been the 99% in general? And so we're not saying that you're the 1%, but you're damn sure in the 99%. And you never were the 99% until your toes stopped being pinched. And, and, you know, it was usually us who were on the bottom, and so they come up with this idealist explanation. Now we're all in this together. It's just like that when the tower came down, you know, when the, when the, uh, and all, everybody, I never knew white people knew the lyrics to We Shall Overcome ah. until that damn tower. And then you have the black people and the black people, We Shall Overcome. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so, uh, so long as this mode of production remains in existence, so long will extremes of wealth and poverty remain. Uh, and so long will uh, socialist ideas of justice be opposed by capitalist ideas of justice. The task of socialists, therefore, is to organize and lead the struggle of the working class against the capitalist class uh, to the point where the working class takes power from the capitalist class, to the colonized take power from the colonizer, and the working class of the colonial uh, peoples are the one who will ascend to power. If we do not understand this, then we cannot find a way to fight effectively uh, for socialism. So we shall find that our socialist ideas are constantly disappointed and betrayed. Uh, such indeed has been the experience of British socialism. It's more than that. If you can't condemn uh, parasitic capitalism, I'm not talking about, as Lenin talked about, how capitalism became parasitic at a certain stage in development going toward imperialism. We say capitalism started parasitic. Capitalism uh, was a birth born by imperialism and not the other way around. If you can't condemn, you're not doing me any favor when you're talking about how bad capitalism is. You gotta say how bad parasitic capitalism, capitalism that rests upon a foundation of slavery and colonialism and the ongoing domination of the people around the world. How in the hell can you have a situation today uh, where people extolling capitalism and say communism has failed, socialism has failed, look at Venezuela, look at this and that. Uh, uh, when the fact of the matter is the whole world lives under capitalist domination. And if you look at the whole world, 80% of the people on the whole world are trying to survive off $10 or less a day. That's the capitalist world that we're looking at, not the communist world, not the socialist world. That's the consequence of capitalism. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, so uh, right through uh, history, indeed, idealism has been a weapon of reaction. Uh, whatever fine system of philosophy uh, have been invented, idealism has been used as a means of justifying the rule of an exploiting class and deceiving the exploited. This is not to say the truths have not been expressed in an idealist guise. Of course they have. Martin Luther King, you know, I uh, mean, was able to tell some truth. Of course, if a materialist would check him every now and then uh, and would say that uh, your dream is a nightmare. He said, you're talking about I have a dream. <laughs> he said, well, black people living in a real nightmare. I mean, that's, that was Malcolm. Constantly throwing out, a, and Malcolm was not a consistent materialist, but he was a materialist, and he would constantly challenge that idealist nonsense that Martin Luther King and other people were uh, giving us. He constantly challenged, he talking about the so called Negro Revolution. He said, There's a difference in the Negro Revolution and the Black Revolution. He said, You don't even use the term revolution. You don't know what revolution means. What's the motive of a revolution? What's the basis of a revolution? What the, what the, how a revolution uh, is fought, and this kind of stuff. Malcolm was, that was one of the reasons Malcolm uh, split, was the split between Malcolm and the Nation of Islam, because Malcolm became a materialist and that's why you've never heard not a single other person none before then or since then Malcolm talk about revolution because Malcolm became a materialist uh, was moving more and more toward materialism actually had begun to say socialism was the way forward okay um, say so this is not to say that uh, Truths have not been expressed in an idealist guise. Of course they have, for realism has, idealism has very deep roots in our ways of thinking, and so men often clothe their thoughts and aspirations in idealist dress. But the idealist form is always an impediment, a hindrance in the expression of truth, uh, a source of confusion and error. I'm going to, um, uh, to uh, page 26 now, and this guy is confused here, where he says Marxist, as the organized vanguard of the working class fighting to end all exploitation of man by man and to establish communism have no use for idealism in, in any form. And certainly 
Uh, the Marxists are not the damn uh, vanguard of the working class. We know that for sure. Uh, here, for example, are some of the ways in which Lenin expressed himself on this question. Uh, uh, quote, the genius of Marx and Engels consisted in the very fact that in the course of a long period, nearly half a century, they developed materialism, uh, that they further advanced 100, uh, one fundamental trend in philosophy. Uh, take the, uh, the various philosophical utterances by Marx, and you will find an invariable basic motif. These uh, insistence upon materialism and contemptuous derision of any obscurantism, of all confusion and all deviations uh, toward idealism. Marx and Engels were partisan in philosophy uh, from start to finish. They were not. They were not from start to finish. I mean, uh, uh, and we we were more. We we're going to look more and more in this whole discussion. Because right now we're just talking about materialism, more or less, and versus idealism. But we're going to move be, with this. We'll learn some things, and then when we go to the whole question of dialectics versus metaphysics, then we'll see, you know, other things that we'll see how and why we came to be African internationalists. Because it's not good enough. I don't like uh, the, to just tell people things. I like also to say how I came to this conclusion. If you read uh, 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 any of the political reports, I mean, I've spent a lot of time trying to explain how I came to the conclusion so people can check me. So you can check me. You use the same, you can look at how I came to this conclusion. You say, I don't like the method you use. Or you can say, I use the same method and I didn't come to that conclusion. You can have the ability to check me. You understand? And that's, you know, that's what we want to be able to do. So, uh, on every issue, we are partisans of materialism against idealism. This is because we know uh, that uh, it is in the light of materialist theory, which studies things as they are, without idealist fantasies about them, that we can understand the forces of nature and society, so as to be able to transform society and to master the forces of nature. And because of this too, materialism teaches us to have confidence in ourselves, in the working class, in people, it teaches us that there are no mysteries beyond our understanding, that we need not accept that which is as being the will of God, that we should contemptuously reject the authoritative teachings of those who set up uh, to be our masters, and that, they, that we can ourselves understand nature and society so as to be able to change them. We hate idealism uh, because under cover of high-sounding talk, it preaches the subjection of man to man, and it belittles the power of humanity. It, it was the materialist confidence in humanity which was expressed by Maxim Gorky when he wrote, quote, For me, there are no ideas beyond man. For me, man and only man is the miracle worker and the future master of all forces of nature. The most beautiful things <coughs> in, our, in this our world are the things made by labor. Uh, made by skilled human hands, and all our ideas are born out of the process of labor. And if it is thought necessary to speak of sacred things, then the one sacred thing is the dissatisfaction of man with himself and his striving to be better than he is. Sacred is his hatred of all the trivial rubbish which, which he himself has created, Sacred is his desire to do away with greed, envy, crime, disease, war, and all enmity between men on earth, and sacred is his labor. So that is the end of uh, this uh, chapter, and I think we have just a few minutes that we can entertain uh, discussion uh, by people on this question. And I want to say that I know that this is a relatively difficult uh, study because it challenges a lot of things that we understand and how we approach things in the world. But I'm hoping that you will read what we have done up to now and I'm hoping that if you can to use uh, uh, this study, the video and what have you, uh, to go along with what it is that, that you're reading because it's really important. We, we're having this discussion because our objective is to uh, train working class intellectuals, to arm the African working class with a worldview that is scientific so that the working class does not have to rely on any force uh, other than itself and its allies in order to change the world and make the world what it needs to be. We remove all barriers between human beings and knowledge because human beings can know, we are convinced of this, 
can know everything there is to know and all that we don't know today. And there is ignorance about so many different questions. And I am ignorant and you are ignorant, but I know that I can learn. Yeah. And I know that the people can learn. And that's the thing that materialism, materialism helps us. And this is the struggle we're involved in. We're not trying to have this discussion to battle anybody's belief. We are trying to raise up the working class so that the working class can become the master of the new society that has to be created by the working class, that we take advantage and control of everything that we have created as colonized subject people who we've worked for the last 500 years for our oppressors, and we've got nothing in return for. We cannot afford, especially at this critical time, in the crisis of imperialism, we must fight for a scientific understanding of the world. We have to clear up any mystery. We have to uh, uh, make clear uh, everything. And the advanced attachment, the revolutionary party, has to have possession of the scientific approach to, to every question. So that's all I wanted to say on that. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Comrade T'Challa. World. World. Yeah. Hmm. I think it's important for us to recognize, and we do recognize, that one, the power of our oppressor has often been the first to assault the belief systems of society. And, and these belief systems are often called religion, uh, especially today. We talk about religion. But, but when we say religion, uh, generally speaking, what we're talking about is what the Europeans have done. And Europeans have this thing where every Sunday uh, they go to church, they sing the song, they pay the preacher, uh, uh, and they, you know, that's the essence of it. But most people, when they talk what we refer to as religion today, most people have a way of life. And this way of life has come under assault. And even when you go back to biblical stories and stuff like that, uh, the greatest sinners were those who are strayed away from the way of life of the societies that the Bible, uh, 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 you know, represented. And so the, the struggle was between this way of life, this interpretation of our reality, and somebody else's. Somebody can take away your belief system and impose a foreign and hostile belief system on you, then we've seen that as being you know, a problem. I mean, the old saying used to be when a white man came to Africa, uh, we had the land, he had the Bible. Uh, then uh, before you know it, you know, we got the Bible and he got all the damn land because it was an assault on the belief system. So this is not a statement about uh, how one belief system is better than the other, but it's this, a statement that uh, a belief system for a society is extremely important. What we're saying is it doesn't have to be a belief system that's based on superstition and stuff like that, and it can be a belief system that has its origin in a, 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 a materialist, uh, a dialectic and materialist understanding of, of things and phenomena, and that's what African internationalism, it gives us a, a way to understand and perceive the world and to live. Uh, that doesn't make us subject to the imperialists or any other power, internal or external, to our communities. Uhuru. Yeah. You know, you've seen a bumper sticker, I think. Uh, uh, so I, so I, I am. am. Uh, but <clears throat> the reality is you, you, you are, therefore you think. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it's bass aquas. And the whole... Uh, uh, I've forgotten exactly uh, this whole thing about mind over matter. The point is that the mind is a product of matter. That is to say, the brain. The brain is matter. And what we think, that is to say, our mind is a product of the matter that's developed to a very high degree. And like I say, the argument is if you think, <clears throat> right now, if you think, right, <clears throat> if your mind tells you, that it is more uh, important than the material world, uh, it is bigger than, uh, more significant than matter, then shoot yourself in the brain and then tell me what you think then, right? And so, I mean, this is just the clearest example of, of the relationship between mind and matter. The mi mind is a product of matter, which is the brain, Uhura. Uh, I think this is a really important discussion because, uh, and, and, uh, because there are people who are in our party. We talk about uh, materialism and we talk about religion and what have you. And in this instance, we are talking about Islam. And one reason we're talking about Islam is because we're talking about a real practicing, studied Muslim uh, in the form of Comrade Abdullah. Uh, but there are Christians all around us, uh, in the party, et cetera, who cannot uh, justify and even offer up a decent explanation for why they are Christians. So we don't have that discussion the same way. 
but also people uh, often uh, don't say who they are. They are they're hidden Christians and uh, et cetera, but we are still African internationalists, which means we are materialists. And a materialist explanation would challenge what you just said, and we will, have, we will talk more and more. My, my uh, uh, thing right now is uh, I'm not so much convinced, trying to convince anybody not to be a Muslim, not to be a Christian. I believe that uh, uh, materialist, uh, 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 ideological, uh, is ideologically sound materialism. It, it's beyond what people like to refer to as spiritualism, which is another way of saying religion. Uh, uh, the fact is that uh, when you talk about Africans being a spiritual people, I think that's true. But I don't, I'm not talking about what most people even come up and say, well, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, which is another way to say I'm calling my religion spiritualism, right? Uh, uh, I'm talking about uh, the thing is that uh, the African spirituality uh, is deep. It's, it's the thing that makes uh, a song stands, start off as, ah! I feel good. Dun, 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 dun. And, and they don't, when they write the lyrics to James Brown, they don't put ow in there. Uh, when you hear these kind of songs, that's a spirituality that's, that's of us. But it ain't religion. It ain't God spooks and stuff like that didn't do it. It's uh, the way uh, we were formed and shaped by our relationship to the material world. That we come from uh, the, uh, uh, tr uh, 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 the continent of Africa. Uh, that provided us with uh, enough so that we were not scrambling for existence all the time. And that's what helped to shape the consciousness of white people, that nature was not kind. Nature was kind uh, to where it was. And somebody said it uh, yesterday, I, it was a brilliant uh, statement that somebody made yesterday about how, I think it might have, it was how, uh, uh, you know, we uh, came out of Africa, how we, you know, civilization and everything came out of Africa. Nobody came there and did that. That was, nature was really kind. And if nature is kind, and you're not spending 24 hours or 18 hours or 30, uh, however many hours a day just trying to, to, to live, just trying to secure yourself, just running to find out where the next crop, you don't even have crops. You're chasing nature all around the world, trying to, all around the place trying to live, you have a whole totally different viewpoint of everything. If you have to scramble for everything you get, where actual uh, thievery becomes a, a mode of production, you know, you had the Vikings, you had the Goths, the Visigoths, you were robbing and stealing and vandals and all this kind of stuff, where in Africa, nature was kind, you know, and so it provided so much of what it is that we needed to exist, uh, and uh, so you had time, you know, like to drum. You had time to learn poetry. You didn't. You weren't in a constant state of uh, of you know doing you know doing horrible things to try to exist and what have you. And and uh, a way of life emerged from this process, and a science emerged from this process. And this science is so interwoven with what we refer to, what people refer to as religion and what have you. I mean, you learn a certain way. I mean, at some point, uh, you hear Muslim Jews. Uh, and other people say, don't eat pork, right? They say, God said this. God said, don't mess with anything with cloven hoofs. Now, there's a scientific basis for that. Because that pork was killing people. You understand? So I can't come and tell you, don't eat pork, man. You crazy try to take my pork chop, I'll take your arm. Right? So, uh, uh, but if God said it, don't eat anything with cloven hoofs and what have you, then it contributes to the ability of the society to be able to accept, you know, uh, this kind of thing. But I'm oversimplifying a lot. And, uh, you know, we don't have any time because we're getting ready to start this meeting. But I appreciate uh, the observations that people make. And I know that this is a trying kind of discussion in so many different ways because it does challenge how we come to perceive uh, so much and, uh, uh, and certain, uh, you know, belief systems that we have adopted. And often we've adopted these belief systems as the way to get out of this stuff that we're in. I mean, even the nation of Islam made an assumption that you had to give black people some kind of religion because we were all in this Christianity and stuff like that. You got to give them some kind of religion in order for people to be free. First of all, I want to appreciate uh, uh, everybody who has participated in this study. And I want to express a deep appreciation to uh, the members of the African People's Socialist Party uh, and the Uhuru movement um, that uh, we have an incredible organization. And uh, we are uh, African internationalists, uh, which effectively means that we are historical materialists. And uh, I'm making this statement because uh, some of us are struggling 
uh, with this question. I mean, we look at Malcolm X, who I just mentioned. Malcolm was not a consistent uh, materialist, uh, but it was materialism that uh, actually began to separate him and, and led to the division between him and the nation of Islam. People like to talk about all the stuff where Malcolm, <coughs> you know, did broke the rules or something, but Malcolm was under assault in the nation. Uh, for a while. Malcolm was under assault with himself because people were approaching Malcolm all the time saying you come as y'all in the nation, y'all talk all that stuff but you don't do nothing. And so Malcolm was hearing this all the time. Malcolm had the most effective uh, 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 organization of the nation, most effective mosque in the nation. Malcolm X led that in New York. And uh, so he was hearing this from the people all the time. Malcolm uh, 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 was learning about revolution and promoting revolution. You didn't hear that coming from any other source in the nation of Islam before or since. And this created dissension and at least the leadership inside the nation of Islam had problems and began to complain about Malcolm X because of this. And so he was moving more and more. Malcolm X had concluded that, uh, had actually come to the conclusion that socialism that everybody was talking about socialism and this was the way forward. That's the distinguishing thing about Malcolm. And I want to say that, you know, because people like to come up with all kind of bogus things about why Malcolm X, uh, you know, uh, was uh, left the nation and, and et cetera. But it was a split that was based on the fact that Malcolm X moved uh, incre increasingly. He became a materialist. And I can give you other uh, examples of that, but I, we don't have that kind of time right now. And I think that uh, we will uh, continue to go through this process. But even inside the party, you see, a striking thing is that we can have somebody say that, well, you know, uh, I want to be uh, uh, an idealist and, and a militarist at the same time. And I'm, I'm not upset about that. And the reason I'm not upset about that, in part, because this comrades from the African working class, stone working class comrade who is struggling with philosophy. That's called religion. You know, struggling with philosophy. Uh, not just in some abstract way. It didn't just go to school and say, I think I want to be a philosopher. But trying to discover uh, a way to deal with the contradiction that we are confronted with in the real world. That's what drove Malcolm to the nation of Islam. That's what devote, drove so many people uh, into, that's why so many people in prison right now, they go toward Islam uh, because they want to discover what the hell is the basis of my condition, the condition of uh, et cetera, and how to get out of here. And so that's the primary thing. So I say right on They're to the class, the class who's looking for answers, that means you're open. When you move away from, from Christianity, if you can move away from Christianity, if you're African and American, that means a certain kind of intellectual openness that has occurred. So I don't care where you are right now. Uh, I mean, in the real sense of the word, as long as you uh, begin to engage in changing the world, uh, because just like the Cubans, when they changed the world, they became changed. In the process of changing the world, we become changed ourselves. And so uh, I'm comfortable with that. And I want to say that, uh, brothers and sisters and comrades, that, that we are revolutionaries and, and that's what, and, and our philosophy informs every damn thing we do. I'm more concerned with people who do not have philosophies than I am concerned with people who know what their philosophy is. At least you know what you're arguing and debating. People who don't, uh, don't confess to a philosophy, because you do. You have a philosophy. Everybody's got one. They just might not be aware of it. it usually it's the philosophy of the, of the ruling class. Even though it may be radical and what have you, <laughs> it's generally the philosophy of the ruling class. <clears throat> but the working class has to have its own philosophy uh, that speaks to its condition and oppression. That's why some people, again, became Muslims. To break from the Christianity that they saw was problematic. That's why there was such a thing as, as, as uh, what do they call it, uh, liberation uh, uh, theology and what have you. You know, to try to break from uh, you know, the traditional thoughts that uh, dominate uh, the world. So our party uh, is opposed to any kind of enslavement of human beings. And enslaved not just by the physical things that uh, affect us, uh, by, but also uh, by ideas and what have you that place limitations on what the human beings can see about our real potential in the world. We say human beings are responsible for how we live in the world and human beings are, are the ones who can change these conditions and but we have to free ourselves you know uh, 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 mentally intellectually uh, in order to be able to get there 
And the African People's Socialist Party, we're a small organization. Uh, and how small we are is not obvious because we create cadre. And the African People's Socialist Party, uh, even though we uh, uh, promote, you know, uh, joining the party and stuff like that, it's, it's not the easiest thing to be in or stay in. Because we believe in discipline and we do have a particular philosophy. And uh, uh, because, uh, you know, <clears throat> we've established a, a certain trajectory for ourselves. And being cadre gives us individuals in the party lead masses of people. Meet, lead committees and other kinds of organizations, don't they, Sister Malika? Individuals do that. And so that our numbers are magnified many times over. That's why philosophy is so important. Because when we go out in the world, we go out and change the world, organize people, communities, and stuff like that. You, got, you see Akile there, 22 years old, and she's commanding all kinds of space, ideologically, political, etc. because she's cadre. And so our, our, our reach is far greater than our numbers. Our organizational presence is far greater than our numbers. Uh, so we have, uh, in terms of who are members of the party, there are more people in our movement, many, 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 many times more people in our movement than there are people in our party. And because we have cadre who uh, have the responsibility of leading masses of people. And we have cadre who have been committed to the ideology, to the organization, to the discipline, and who have become professional revolutionaries, which means that no matter what other, kind, what other occupation we may have, our profession is revolution. It means that we recognize that no people on the planet Earth that's been enslaved has ever won their freedom without first creating an organization, a steel cadre, in order to overturn this system. That's what we recognize. That's what informs us. That's why we go through these studies. And we've been doing this study uh, for five years. And last week, I was up 5 o'clock in the morning because I was on the West Coast. Uh, uh, people in the East Coast were getting up at 8. People in the East Coast getting up at 8. Today, I'm up, up at 7 because it's an hour earlier here. Uh, and, but the point is, is it earlier or later? Earlier here, right? Later. It's an hour later here. So, uh, but we've been doing this for five years now. And uh, uh, because our objective is to deepen the understanding of you leaders who have to, change, who have to lead this struggle, and lead people every damn where. And we have to have a consistent understanding, a, a united understanding of what it is that we're about. We have unity uh, in thought and in action. Unity in will, unity of will and in action. People come to us at uh, different times and they say uh, things like, uh, well, you know, you guys are like automatons. I can go to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, South Africa uh, and ask somebody a, a question and then I can come uh, to the Fifth Ward in Houston, Texas and ask somebody the same question. I get the same answer whether I'm in Texas or in South. Yep, you get the same answer. Uh, because we are united, we are disciplined. You can't break that discipline, you understand. And, but some people have broken out of the discipline, haven't they? And they've done horrible things. They've made horrible attacks on the African People's Socialist Party because they, you don't have people leave and say, I left because I couldn't handle it. Well, I left because I didn't have enough unity. I left because I don't love black people that much to do what's necessary to win freedom. And so they find something with the party to leave for. They fancify things. They make up stuff. And uh, but we don't we don't talk about them, uh, you know, I mean, because we know where the future lies and we're fighting for that future. And every day, more and more people are coming into our party and our movement. And I just want to say that this is why we do this every day. We are developing the cadre because we plan to govern and everybody in this room and everybody who's in this party, no matter where you're located in the world, are part of a is a part of a process to govern, to take and wield political power. And you can't take and wield political power unless you have an instrument to do that, and that instrument is the African People's Socialist Party. Uhuru, yeah. Uhuru.